You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 363 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Summertime is upon us, and like many Americans, I'm headed out on vacation. This year, Tim and I are celebrating our 15th wedding anniversary with a scuba diving trip to the Philippines. Tim and I love to scuba dive as we get to come into contact with sea creatures like turtles, which are my favorite sea creature, and we love the tranquility of just being underwater. Being underwater, we have found, is the best way to disconnect. You can't take your cell phones with you. So as I head out for a few weeks of rest and relaxation, I thought you might enjoy a short road trip series. We did our last road trip in 2019 to great acclaim. You really enjoyed it. So I thought it was high time we do another road trip. The connecting theme for our summer 2023 road trip is water. Water was the easiest way to travel in early North America because most of early North America lacked roads. And the roads that were available to early Americans often weren't any good. They were built of dirt and lumber, and as such were bumpy, prone to mud and flooding, and they often included obstacles right in their middle, such as tree stumps and rocks that people would have to navigate around. So whenever possible, most early Americans turned to rivers, lakes, and oceans when they had to do some travel. So the first stop on our three-stop summer 2023 road trip is the St. Genevieve National Historical Park in Missouri. Located right along the Mississippi River, approximately 620 miles north of New Orleans and 62 miles south of St. Louis, French colonists established the town of St. Genevieve as a trading and agricultural settlement around 1750. The history of St. Genevieve reveals a lot about what it was like to establish a colony in the heartland of North America, so far from the seats of imperial and colonial power. Now, during our visit to the St. Genevieve National Historical Park, National Park Service Interpretive Ranger Claire Casey will provide us with information about the St. Genevieve National Historical Park and how parts of the town became a national historical park, information about why the French established St. Genevieve, and details about life in the town during the 18th century, and how and why St. Genevieve changed imperial hands three times between France, Spain, and the United States. But first, Thank you to Cambridge University Press for sponsoring this episode. Get 20% off the new book, Brooding Over Bloody Revenge, Enslaved Women's Lethal Resistance by historian Nikki Taylor at cambridge.org slash broodingoverbloodyrevenge and use discount code BLOODY20. I'll include a link for this book and the discount code in the show notes. All right, are you ready to stop at the first stop in our three-stop road trip? Without further ado, allow me to reintroduce you to Ranger Claire Casey. Our guest is an interpretive ranger with the National Park Service at the St. Genevieve National Historical Park in St. Genevieve, Missouri. At the St. Genevieve National Historical Park, our guest interprets the history of the first permanent European settlement in Missouri. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Claire Casey. Thanks. Happy to be here. So, Claire, it's my understanding that the St. Genevieve National Historical Park is actually a relatively new national park. Could you tell us about the St. Genevieve site and how and why it became a national park? We are one of the newest. We're not the newest anymore, but we're 422 out of 423. So still up there. We just hit our one year anniversary on October 30th. So. We're excited to have such a good start so far. We interpret the French colonial history of St. Genevieve and of Missouri. And there's a lot of stories beyond that as well. But the primary reason that St. Genevieve got noticed, I would say the first thing that will come to mind for a lot of people is the architecture. It's the largest collection of French vernacular buildings still standing. There's particularly the Poteaux on Terre, which is post and ground buildings. There's about five that we know of left in the country and three are here in St. Genevieve. So that makes it unique. And then 
the more social and cultural aspects of Creole culture becoming developed here, how that's similar and different from other parts of the country and the way that trade and just the colonial system works out here. That's part of how this site became noticed or why it was kind of picked out for the Park Service. Having worked for the National Park Service myself and now for a state government, it really seems like creating a national historical park must need a lot of paperwork. <laughs> what is the actual process? What was the process for St. Genevieve to become a National Park Service site? How did the movement to create a national park begin in St. Genevieve? And what kinds of historical significance did the people who created the park need to prove to the Department of the Interior that this was a site worthy of being made and preserved as a national historical park? Sure. And it is quite the process, as you can imagine. The downtown area, the historic district of St. Genevieve has been on the National Register as a historic district for quite some time. And there's been a pretty strong interest in the local community of bringing the National Park Service here. So there's been a few decades of attempts to make that happen. And it kind of started and stalled in different times, different things coming up. But what it came down to was you have to prove four different criteria or meet four different criteria, one of which is that there's national significance here. We have to connect to the national story. It has to be feasible. It has to be something that is suitable for the Park Service. And it has to need Park Service management. St. Genevieve has a lot of great organizations that are here and have been here much longer than we have in our short year and still doing that historic preservation work, but something was shown as needing or could benefit from the resources that the National Park Service can bring in as well. So there was a big study to make sure that those criteria were met. And then we were established in 2018, I believe. And that means that we can start acquiring land and getting the boundaries set up and going from there. And then we finally opened last October. My brain is forming a mental image of the St. Genevieve National Historical Park as you speak. And it sounds like this national park might encompass the entire town of St. Genevieve. Is that really the case? Is the entire town of St. Genevieve the National Historical Park? That's a great question and something that is commonly confused. It's hard to keep it straight sometimes. So the town is a historic district, but we as the Park Service only operate three of the historic homes, technically four, but one isn't open. So we operate the Beauvais Amaro House, the Jean-Baptiste Ballet House, and we just got the Green Tree Tavern about a month and a half ago. So constantly changing and we might continue to add houses, add some different things to the park as we grow and develop over the years. But for the moment, it's just those three houses that are the National Park Service. And then we share the Welcome Center with the city. So what are the histories that you and the National Park Service interpret as people visit these three different historic buildings and residences? So we start with the French colonial history that, of course, includes some of the American Indian history of this area, but we focus mostly on that contact period. And hopefully we'll be able to expand a little bit beyond that as we continue to grow. And then we look at the transition from colonial to being a part of the United States, how some of the laws and policies change in that transfer. The Beauvais Amaro House in particular, we focus a little bit more on that change because we have two historic families that have lived there, one in the colonial period and one post-colonial. And we see a big shift in the experience of those families. I know we're really anxious to dig into the French and Spanish colonial stories and the American story of Missouri, but one last question about your work as an interpretive ranger. Kyle wonders if he could tell us more about your work. What are your responsibilities and what challenges do you and your colleagues face as you interpret a federally funded historic site? To start with my duties as an interpretive ranger, we do pretty much anything that is working directly with the public or front end types of things like giving tours or doing field trips for school students or managing social media and our website, creating print media. We're working on some temporary exhibits right now. So anything along those lines, what you see when you visit a park is likely coming from the interpretive side of things. Now, there are a lot of challenges that go along with that. One of the bigger challenges with the National Park Service is that 
we are a national agency and we get our staff from across the nation. So oftentimes we aren't experts in the content until we get there and spend some time at a site. So especially being a new site and we don't really have the institutional knowledge built up yet for a lot of the content here. We are very, very lucky to have all of those other historic organizations in town who are partners with us and who share all sorts of resources with us. But we do still have a lot of baseline research to do and a lot of kind of getting started. And along with that, this is a place that, and this is true for a lot of park service sites, that a lot of people have very personal connections to and are concerned about how a National Park Service is going to present a story that they are very personally connected to or present the history or manage it. You know, people want to see land and cultural resources managed in certain ways. And so we do have to be respectful of all the people who have connections to this place, whether it's people we are formally partners with or who are in the local community or have other connections and are no longer in the area. So we do have to keep all those different perspectives in mind and try to connect with a lot of different perspectives and balance those without leaning too heavily one way or the other. Let's dig into some of this early Missouri history and historical interpretation. Now, the St. Genevieve National Historical Park commemorates the first European settlement in Missouri. Claire, what was St. Genevieve, Missouri like before the French came and established a community along the Mississippi River? Would you tell us about the geography of the site and provide us with an overview of the indigenous peoples who consider this site part of their homelands? I can give you some broad strokes. I will say again that I am new to some of this history and there's a long, very extensive history of different Native nations living in this area. So I encourage others if they want to learn more to do what we do and go straight to the source, you know, learn from the people whose history it is. But the broad strokes of it is that this area, just like much, if not all of the United States, has thousands of years of human history. We know that Illinois tribes called this place home for a long time, and they were here when the French were first coming in, but those numbers start to dwindle. They start to move to other areas. And once the town of St. Genevieve is being established around 1750, this is largely Osage country. And the Osage were pretty powerful at that time. And even though they didn't have, you know, a city or a town right here in St. Genevieve, this was still very much a part of their territory. If you look at their traditional homeland, it includes all of Missouri. So we're still very much in that space. And so they had their cities that generally followed a similar pattern of how they built them, where people were living, how they were structured. They were farming, they were hunting in this area and, you know, going about life here. So that's essentially where we kind of end up once St. Genevieve is starting to come into being. So what was the draw of Missouri and the site of St. Genevieve for the French? What brought the French to Missouri? A lot of the same reasons that any of those Native nations were here. The area is a floodplain, so you have very rich soil, great for farming. You do have plenty of hunting resources out here, hunting opportunities. And larger than that, in this area, you have the waterways. That's great for travel, for trade, for reaching into the interior. And this area was full of mines. And I say that having seen a map from the 1700s that literally just says place full of mines. And even before the, you know, any European settlers were here, a lot of the different American Indian nations were using those mines. And salt making here as well. We see La Saline is a great place for getting some salt. And that's a huge boost to trade and preserving food and all that stuff. So the agriculture, the mining, there's lead mining in this area too. And surface mines were being used here as well. And then those waterways to connect everyone. Salt is such an important commodity in this age before refrigeration. You needed a lot of salt to preserve your food. So I can understand why the French might be excited about this area. Now, as the settlers came to St. Genevieve to farm and to mine, did they establish these farms and work these mines with the idea that they would consume most of the produce that they produced? Or did these French settlers count on a way to get their goods to other French markets in places like New Orleans, Montreal and Quebec, and perhaps even into the French Caribbean? Yeah, 
Absolutely. We want to see this place as the frontier. And in some ways it is, but St. Genevieve was incredibly connected to the larger systems, the larger economy. And the French had been colonizing in North America for a while before St. Genevieve is established. We know that the town is established by 1750. And prior to that, across the river, or what was across the river at the time, it's now on this side, but Kaskaskia and Cahokia had already become French towns as well. And so St. Genevieve, we see, produces a lot of wheat and a lot of, again, that lead mining that happens here. All of this becomes a huge boost to the economy by exporting it. A little bit to everywhere, but especially down to New Orleans. And that becomes kind of the trend. So they were definitely doing it for their own sustenance, but also producing for a larger system of maintaining this colonial system that's stretching across the continent. So it sounds like St. Genevieve's proximity to the Mississippi River was really key to the economic success of this community and for connecting St. Genevieve to this wider French colonial world of New Orleans and, you know, other places in the Atlantic and in New France. Again, New Orleans is the main place that folks are exporting goods to. So you're just going straight down the river. And St. Genevieve originally was established right on the river. And even where I'm sitting today is only about a mile and a half from the river. So it's very close. And that being your highway for the time period is very efficient. and It's a good source for the folks living here. Now, Ariel is curious about life in early St. Genevieve. So Say we're a new colonist and we've just arrived in St. Genevieve. What are we going to see and what would our daily lives be like? What are the daily rhythms in St. Genevieve? And just like anywhere, it's going to vary a little bit depending on how well off you are and what your situation is. But for the most part, we see that it's a largely Catholic town. The church remains pretty heavily central to ongoings here. and. You'll see families here. It's not just men who are being sent to try and extract things from the land and send that back. We see some families. We do see it does stay disproportionate, men to women. And we see that there's some intermarriage that goes on between the French colonists and some of the different people from these American Indian tribes in the area. Because of that, we do see, again, with trade and that being a large part of them being here, interacting with those different nations, we see a lot of kind of mixing of culture here in St. Genevieve. The people of town generally wore moccasins everywhere. You know, we see these pieces that are getting swapped between these different people. Your home was usually two or three rooms. They're just kind of right next to each other. There's no hallways. Those rooms would be multi-use. You're not really designating a bedroom. We see that there's a lot of Good food that they're importing too, not just, you know, exporting goods, but they're bringing in rum and coffee and tea. And the folks who are wealthy are bringing in things like crystal and silver and fancy soap from France and, you know, all these different things. And then when it comes to how you're spending your time in the evening, dancing and music was pretty common. That's a pretty lively group of people. And we see a lot of holidays that are celebrated here. Again, being a very Catholic area, it's usually those Catholic holidays. But then, you know, Sundays were also days of getting together. And, you know, there were auctions and a lot of recreation going on as well. As you're talking and I'm forming my mental image of what it would be like to arrive in Colonial St. Genevieve around 1750, I'm trying to get a better sense of the layout of the town and where its people live. So are we talking about a place where Everyone kind of lives in the center of town and then maybe works a farm that's located outside of town, you know, kind of like what we would see in an early New England village or an early Dutch village. Or is this more like what we'd see in more southern colonies like Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina, where most people didn't live in town? They lived on their homesteads, on their farms outside of town and then came into a small town center to conduct business and to see people. One of the things that's unique to that French settlement pattern is having a town center where folks are living relatively close together. Here, we actually see that kind of grid show up of, you know, they're trying their best to plan out a gridded city with a 
central area where the church is and things like that. And then the farming happens in Le Grand Champ or the big field. And it's a common field in a sense. It's not open to everyone all year round, but people have their plots, these long skinny plots that they were farming. And one big fence went around the whole thing. They had a free roaming livestock. So you had to keep the livestock out to prevent them from trampling your crops. But then you were kind of all farming in that one big field together. And then you come back to that town center for your home. And that structure we see is a little bit more unique to that French way of planning out a community. You mentioned that St. Genevieve developed into a place where lots of cultural exchange took place. You know, you have St. Genevieve's residents trading with the local Osage communities. And I do wonder if we could talk a bit more about this trade, because when we typically talk about French residents trading with indigenous communities, we are typically talking about the fur trade. Was the fur trade the reason why residents of St. Genevieve traded with the Osage or were they trading for other goods like the mine goods of salt and lead that you said the Osage had been mining well before the French had arrived in the area? Yeah, so a little bit of everything. We see that St. Genevieve is less focused on the fur trade than other French communities at the time. Still a part of it here, again, a lot of the hunting, there's plenty of areas to go hunting and and get some of those furs around here, but it revolves more on the salt and lead and some of the produce. But a lot of the transactions were based on salt, similar to what we see throughout the nation. This is kind of where it does reflect that national story is some of the things that happen all over is that, you know, we do see some of the Osage goods becoming things that are taken on here in town. We see those furs coming in and then that salt, guns, the lead for various uses was being traded as well. So it's about what you would expect, just a little bit of everything, just a little bit less focused on the furs than other places. Now, what about slavery in Colonial St. Genevieve? Most communities in colonial North America practiced some form of slavery. And we have talked about the fact that there is mining and there are agricultural fields to tend. So do the French colonists of St. Genevieve also practice slavery? And if they did, were they practicing the African chattel slavery that we see in so much of colonial British North America? Or were they practicing more Native American slavery, which seemed to be more typical in a lot of French and Spanish towns and Native American communities? pretty much from the Great Lakes region on west and even south of that region. It's both. We definitely see slavery used here to the point that throughout the colonial period, it's pretty standard that 30 to 40 percent of the people living here were people who were enslaved. So it's a pretty sizable number. And that includes people of African descent, but also American Indians here as well as the French are playing into that pre-existing American Indian slave system. So we see the chattel slavery with people of African descent here. And we see that Indian slavery gets outlawed much, much earlier here than African slavery. And African slavery continues. So that's definitely something that is a part of the history here. It is an agricultural town, even with the mining and trying to get stuff up and down the river. Any of those labor-intensive jobs were being based on slave labor and the people who were enslaved here. 30 to 40 percent of St. Genevieve's population was enslaved. What was life like in St. Genevieve for the enslaved population? It seems like there must have been opportunities to form some sort of enslaved or free community life, given that there is this large percentage of people living in St. Genevieve sharing this enslaved condition. So we do see a different system than what we know of in the British history or the American history. Slavery here was based on Code Noir, which was the French slave system. That being said, different doesn't mean better. It's different, but it is definitely still dehumanizing and enslaving people. So we know that a lot of these individuals were working in agriculture. We know that a lot of them were sent out to the mines to do the lead mining, and that that was in particular seen as kind of a lower job to have. And then we see they're also serving as oarsmen or being, you know, forced to be the ones to take it down and 
transport things down to New Orleans and things like that. Some of the things that are different here will often surprise people. But again, difference, not better. But we see that Code Noir allows for some things and does not allow for some things that's different from the British slave history or what people are more familiar with. For instance, owners could not force the people who they were enslaving to work on Sundays. So we see, again, that religious aspect comes through in kind of all aspects of life here. They also were not allowed to break up families. You couldn't sell a father away from his wife and children or children away from their parents. But we also see that that's a limited definition of family. If, you know, a brother could be sold away from his sister and once a child turns a certain age or goes through puberty, you can sell them as a separate individual. So we see limitations on that. And we see that St. Genevieve is a place that's away from administrative centers. So it's a little easier to get away with breaking some of the code noir. And in some ways that works out to provide a little bit of a benefit for the people who are enslaved a little bit. In the instance of like some slave owners let their slaves carry guns. That was something that could be used as an opportunity, but is also being done for the owner's benefit. You know, this is an attempt to protect their own property. That's how they're viewing it. And then there's instances of the opposite, you know, things like not breaking up families. Well, people, if they did that, there's only so much enforcement for that. So we do see instances of people kind of breaking away from Code Noir, even though that's the written regulations of this. So in terms of the day-to-day life for these people who were enslaved here, that's something that we're still digging into a little bit to try and get to some of these individual stories. We know that there were some planned group escapes from St. Genevieve over the history, both in the colonial and post-colonial period. So we see some freedom seekers here, you know, trying to get out of that process. One of the other things that we see happen is that once St. Genevieve becomes Spanish, there is an opportunity to work on Sundays or work on holidays to earn some money, and you could potentially buy your own freedom. And so we do see free people of color become a part of this community as well. And then that plays into a whole different side of the story. It's like you read my mind because I was just (laughs) going to ask whether a community of free people of color developed in St. Genevieve because... We have spoken with other scholars about French Code Noir in French Louisiana, and I'm thinking here about episode 308 when we spoke with Jessica Marie Johnson about colonial New Orleans. And I recall Jessica saying that early on, the Code Noir did allow for enslaved people to earn money and buy their freedom. But as we progress from the 17th century into the 18th century and the 18th century into the 19th century, the Code Noir just became way more restrictive and fewer and fewer enslaved people were able to take advantages of the provisions in the code that allowed them to do things like buy their freedom. So I guess I'm curious about the development and the change over time in the Code Noir and how that played out in St. Genevieve. Do we see the Code Noir becoming more restrictive in St. Genevieve as we move from the 18th to the 19th centuries? Very similar. It sounds, based on what you just said, that's what happens here as well. We do see it's limited numbers who are able to save up enough and get access to that because you had to get permission to do that too. It's not like you could just choose to work and earn money. There are those control factors still in place. And the price was not standardized. The owner could set the price that they wanted based on a number of factors. And then that person would have to try to get that much and try to manage it. So we do see that happen to a limited extent. But we do, you know, have free people of color who are living here and free black individuals in particular, because of course, we have the American Indians who are here. But we do see differences in treatment between those two groups. Even in the colonial period, any person who gained their freedom could potentially become a property owner too. We do, of course, see limitations on the rights of Black people here in St. Genevieve, even after they've gained freedom. But many of them do become property owners, and especially as we get into the late colonial period and then early into being a part of the United States here, 
we see more free people of color who are living here and experiencing a different version of St. Genevieve and still adding bits of their culture and their experience to the story here. We do see a number of things pop up from African cultures that get transmitted to Missouri and get transmitted to St. Genevieve. So they're just as much active members and influencing this community despite the limited rights that they're given. So in 1750, the French established this new colonial town of St. Genevieve along the banks of the Mississippi River in what is now the present day state of Missouri. This town was primarily an agricultural town. There was some salt and lead mining in the area. And St. Genevieve primarily traded with the large French colonial hub at New Orleans, although some of its trade goods did make its way to Montreal and Quebec and possibly even into the French Caribbean, which really shows us how integrated this frontier town of St. Genevieve was within the larger French empire and Atlantic world. Now, when you think about it, the French settlers really would have only had about four or five years to establish their community and trade routes before the French and Indian or Seven Years War broke out in 1754-1755. Claire, we need to take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, but when we get back, we'd love to investigate the ways that this Seven Years War really impacted daily life in St. Genevieve. Cambridge University Press has published a new book called Brooding Over Bloody Revenge, Enslaved Women's Lethal Resistance, by historian Nikki Taylor. We know from speaking with guest historians on this podcast that American slavery was a violent institution that enslaved people cleverly resisted in a lot of different ways. In Brooding Over Bloody Revenge, historian Nikki Taylor investigates enslaved women's use of lethal force as a method of resisting slavery. Using case studies, Brooding Over Bloody Revenge charts the complexity of enslaved women's lives and their use of lethal resistance from the colonial period through the antebellum or pre-Civil War United States. In doing so, Nikki Taylor strongly challenges assumptions that enslaved women served only as the victims of their white enslavers' violence and only participated in covert, nonviolent forms of resistance. Taylor makes these challenges by demonstrating how enslaved women consistently seize justice for themselves and organize towards revolt. Cambridge University Press offers you the chance to purchase Brooding Over Bloody Revenge at a discount. Save 20% by ordering your copy today at cambridge.org slash brooding over bloody revenge and use discount code bloody20 at the checkout. Get the book historian Catherine Clinton is called A Brilliant Tour de Force, and Ben Franklin's World guest Karen Cook Bell has described as a compelling narrative not only of Black women's deadly force, but also of their organized and collective resistance. Brooding over bloody revenge. Save 20% by ordering your copy today at cambridge.org slash brooding over bloody revenge and use discount code bloody20 at the checkout. I'll include a link to this book and its discount code in the show notes. Claire, could you tell us if and how the Seven Years War, really the first global war, impacted life in St. Genevieve? That's a good question. I, I don't have an answer for that. There may have been some impacts on trade and availability of things. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. That's okay. You said that this is a new national historical park and there's still a lot of research underway to get at the many different aspects of St. Genevieve's history. One aspect of the Seven Years' War that I know you know, though, is that St. Genevieve entered the war as a French town under French governance and exited the war as a Spanish town under the governance of Spain. Could you tell us how this happened, how St. Genevieve became a Spanish territory? My best understanding, the war was kind of wrapping up and the French had been working with the Spanish and kind of owed them something out of it. And there was a fear of when trying to, you know, develop that last treaty with the British, that this land would then go to the British. And there was this goal to keep this out of British hands, right? That benefits both the French and the Spanish at this point. And so the French transfer it to the Spanish kind of before the war has officially ended. And then that way, when they're finalizing things with the British, it's not theirs to give to the British anymore. And so it becomes Spanish territory as this big game of keep away from Britain. That makes a lot of sense as throughout the colonial period, Great Britain, France, Spain, and at times the Netherlands, they all worried about what would happen if one European empire became dominant in North America. And of course, this worry didn't actually stop those empires from vying for dominance in North America, 
they really just didn't want another rival to control a lot of North American territory. Now, Jeremy is curious about what the transition from French to Spanish colony must have been like for the residents of St. Genevieve. Do we have any records that tell us how the colonists of St. Genevieve experienced this transition in governance and empire from France to Spain? We do see some change in laws and policies. And then in another sense, we see very little change in the day-to-day. So before I get into what changes, it's interesting to look at, you know, the Spanish and French were both Catholic countries. So there is that connection in religion. And again, that was very central to life here. So that was important to a lot of the citizens of St. Genevieve. And the Spanish and French had Bourbon monarchs. So you have monarchs from the same family. In some ways, that transition's not too rough because there's some similarity in the culture, some kind of united against the British. So we see a lot of French people who were on the opposite side of the Mississippi come over to be in Spanish territory because that's more familiar, that's more comfortable. And the Spanish took a pretty hands-off approach to this area. They wanted to maintain, but they really were more concerned about protecting New Orleans. And so they were still the you know higher up administrators for this area, but largely St. Genevieve remains very French, culturally speaking. And that Creole French, that mixing of cultures here continues. So where we see the change is largely in the broader laws and policies, especially when it comes to American Indians. And I keep using that broad term because while it is mostly Osage, there are other nations who migrate into this area or already called it home and are still here. And so we see that ending of American Indian slavery happens under the Spanish. Again, we're far from an administrative center. So there are people who work their way around that. And it doesn't really do anything for the people who were already enslaved. But it does end it in name. We also see, despite that, some kind of harsher relationships in a sense. The Spanish try to go to war with the Osage and quickly realize, oops, not a good idea. The Osage are going to win out on that. So instead, they try to convince some other nations to take some land and create a bit of a buffer between the Osage and New Orleans and further south. So we see some different relationships there. And we do see that change to being able to earn money for if you are enslaved on those Sundays and holidays, that becomes more common under the Spanish. But in terms of the day-to-day culture here in St. Genevieve, outside of those things, we don't see a lot of change with that transfer. And it certainly wouldn't be the last border change to happen to the citizens here. So it's just part of life in the colonies. By 1763, St. Genevieve existed as a culturally French community under Spanish governments. And not long after St. Genevieve had started to make this transition from French to Spanish governance, the American Revolution broke out within Great Britain's North American colonies along the Atlantic seaboard. Claire, we know from speaking with scholars like Kathleen Duvall, which we did in episode 37, that the Spanish participated in the revolution and that the revolution really had some consequences for Spanish colonial settlements in Florida and Louisiana. So, Did the residents of St. Genevieve feel any of these effects from the American Revolution? Was the revolution something that even reached as far west as present-day Missouri? We do see that being on the river there, there's some trade happening between the French and the Americans to, you know, they're still happy to sell to the Americans at that point. So there is a little bit of support happening in that sense. And then there's a battle that happens up in St. Louis the Battle of San Carlos, the Battle of St. Louis. And we actually see a fair amount of St. Genevieve militiamen get sent up to St. Louis to support the American. Well, again, it's really about being against the British, right? <laughs> it's, it's less supporting the Americans and more about defeating the British. And so they do send some forces up and they participate in that battle. And depending on who you ask, some would say that without the support of St. Genevieve, that battle would have gone the other way. But there's a lot more information out there about that through some of our partners than what I have on hand. We've talked about this throughout our conversation, but to be direct about it, did French and Spanish imperial life and really the imperial politics of France and Spain 
have much impact on life in St. Genevieve. It really seems like the residents of St. Genevieve would play the roles of empire that each empire asked them to. But it also seems like this community was just kind of isolated, you know, even as it was connected to entrepots like New Orleans. You know, it's impossible to be completely separate, right? This is the world that they are in. And again, they are connected to the trade and the economy. We see that when these different events happening abroad or even on the other side of the continent, that influences who migrates into St. Genevieve and who migrates out. So the example I gave earlier, the other side of the Mississippi becoming British, we see both French people on the east side coming over to St. Genevieve. And as these changes over in the east continue to happen, we also see different native nations migrating over as they get pushed off of their own home or out of their own home. And so it's touched in those two senses that who migrates in and who lives here is affected by it and the trade and economy is affected by it. And we see that show up in that some of the material culture as well. The houses here have these big porches, oftentimes wraparound porches. And that's a Caribbean architectural element. That's not French, despite these very French styles of building. And so without that larger system and the French going to the Caribbean and the African slave trade and all these different aspects going on in the world, St. Genevieve wouldn't look how it looks. On the other hand, they are somewhat separate. They are away from New Orleans and Quebec and where some of these larger power centers are. And so they are able to kind of live their lives and let the political stuff happen way over there. And we do see that some of the primary sources from colonial St. Genevieve, the citizens are described as being not very political, not very interested in the politics. That's stuff for other people to deal with. So while they may not have interacted a lot with it directly, it definitely still shapes what the town looks like, who's living here the different processes happening here. Now, in addition to war and the politics of empire having some impact on the lives of those who lived in St. Genevieve, natural disasters also seem to have impacted the lives of those who lived in St. Genevieve. Claire, would you tell us about the great St. Genevieve flood of 1785? Of course, living on the Mississippi, living on a river, you're going to have to deal with floods. And the Mississippi gives a lot to the people who live here, but it can also cause quite a bit of damage and be a little bit of a trickster. So the flood in 1785 was bad enough that the town decides to move. It's not a group decision. It's not a, you know, suddenly the whole town picks up and leaves. But people start to move their own home and start to ask for land a little bit further away. And we see a slow kind of movement, slow rebuilding to where St. Genevieve is today. And so, you know, floods still continue to be an issue here. There is a really big one in 1993 that caused a lot of damage around here. You can't escape it if you're a river town. It's still going to happen. But that gave them just a little bit of a buffer away from the river to maybe not experience quite as bad of a flood situation as often. When you rebuild a town, and we understand that the rebuilding of St. Genevieve wasn't a group decision, but that it was a process that happened house by house as individuals made the decision to move farther from the river. But when you build a new house, you might build it differently from your previous house. You know, you might add new features that your old house didn't have, or your taste in architecture and furnishings might have changed. So that style is new. There is 35 years between the establishment of St. Genevieve in 1750 and the flood of 1785. So I'm wondering, did moving and rebuilding St. Genevieve change any of the architecture and feel of this culturally French Creole community? It's hard to say because we don't have much left. We really don't have anything left of old St. Genevieve. These architectural styles, this French vernacular vertical log style, had already been around for hundreds of years at that point. So the fact that they were still building them that way and what we see still standing here in St. Genevieve today matches up a lot with what we see in Normandy and in Quebec, which predated, you know, old St. Genevieve. So from my understanding, no, it didn't have a huge impact on the architecture. 
Now, this is a place of creolization and that mixing of cultures and we see those porches come in. So there may have been some change reflected in this broader period of being in a new region, but not necessarily from old to new St. Genevieve. And speaking of this place of creolization where different cultures intermixed and interacted with each other, in 1804, the people of St. Genevieve would interact with yet another culture, an American culture, because St. Genevieve experienced yet another change to its imperial or national governance. In 1803, the United States purchased the Louisiana Territory, which by 1803 had yet again gone from Spanish hands to French hands. The United States purchased the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon. So by 1804, we're now talking about a place, St. Genevieve, that has gone from French governance to Spanish governance, back to French governance, and now to United States governance. Claire, what do we know about this final transition to American governance? How did this last transition impact the lives and cultures of those who lived in St. Genevieve? Similar to when it transfers to the Spanish, St. Genevieve most immediately feels the impact in the laws and policies. We see a pretty big shift in rights here, broadly speaking. One example is for women. Under the colonial systems, the women of St. Genevieve were able to own their own property. When they got married, that property would stay theirs and marriage agreements that determined what property would be communal between the spouses and which would remain their own were common. We see women playing a big role in the businesses that their husbands are participating in. And oftentimes their husbands were away. So the women would be the ones to make decisions and manage a lot of it. So that starts to shift as this becomes a part of the United States. We also see a big shift in how slavery is handled because we now have that kind of British system or the child of the British system under the American government that doesn't allow for some of the things that were allowed for under Code Noir. So we don't see those protections for splitting up families. We don't see the protections for you know not having to work Sundays and things like that. And we see some harsher relationships with the Osage and other Native nations here. In the colonial period under the French and Spanish, there were some raids on town or raids on people, people's homes. They were largely nonviolent. And the French didn't typically go hunt down what was taken from them. They, it was just kind of, okay, that's part of being out here. But we do start to see a lot less of a willingness to work with the nations here. Not to say that relationships were ever perfect, but it does get a bit more tense, a bit more focused on conflict, because it is a pretty big shift in St. Genevieve. When does the United States government start to really make its presence known in St. Genevieve? It sounds like American laws and American policies and views on things like slavery and indigenous relations make their way to St. Genevieve before actual government personnel made their way to St. Genevieve? Or did St. Genevieve really just continue to be so far enough removed from the United States government back in Washington, D.C., that it really took a while for its presence to be fully felt? Yeah, and we do still see some of that continue as this becomes a part of the United States in the sense that you can't change a culture overnight, right? Everything's not going to suddenly shift. And so it is a slow progression of that happening here. I don't know that I could point to a exact moment or, you know, a year where it's like, oh, yeah, now you really start to feel it. But it's just that gradual shift. And a lot of it comes from people from other parts of the United States start to come over. And we see more and more German immigration to St. Genevieve. And so we start to see the population change. And that's probably when you start to see more of that shift in culture and day to day life by 1840s, 1850s, we see more German heritage here than French heritage. So that creates a big shift in that culture as well. So really, even after the implementation of the United States government, we're still talking about a town, St. Genevieve, that continues to play a role that it had always had played as a place where different cultures interacted and intermixed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, after Missouri statehood, we see that the counties get rearranged a little bit. And so St. Genevieve loses some of the control over those mining resources and some of those broader kind of further out things that were drawing people to the area. So we see that that movement of people into St. Genevieve slows down. 
after that. And it's no longer on par with St. Louis. St. Louis starts to get much more attention, much more interest for business and opportunities there. So there's certainly a continuation of different people being here, different people interacting. And then those migrations and start to slow down once we hit that rearranging. Well, Claire, we've covered a lot of ground here because we've now gone from before 1750 through to 1820 when Missouri becomes a state with the Missouri Compromise. Before we move into the time warp, is there any other aspect of St. Genevieve's early history that we haven't talked about yet that you think we should really know about? I think what makes St. Genevieve such an interesting place to me personally is that process of creolization, that it is a French colonial town, but there were a lot of people living here who weren't French and a lot of people who were interacting with the community who weren't French. And just that process of what stays the same and what changes and what leads to changes happening is a question that we can explore here with the history of St. Genevieve. And there's just so many examples of kind of swapping cultural bits and pieces under many different circumstances and many different contexts. But it all was this ongoing process of a lot of change in the time period and a place that we think of as being very static. But there is just a lot of change here. That's a really great setup for our time war question because you couldn't know it, Claire. <laughs> but we're going to talk a lot about change during the time war. Now, the time warp is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, what might have happened if St. Genevieve had remained entirely under French governance until the Louisiana Purchase in 1804? How might the life and culture of the St. Genevieve community have been different? To answer that, I have to think about what are the biggest changes we do see under the Spanish and what if those things didn't happen, right? And I think some of the bigger changes that we see have to do with the relationships with the Osage and the other nations here. And I can't say that relationships got to be horrible in that period, but that would be the thing that I would expect to have been shifted a little bit. You know, if those more mutually beneficial relationships had continued a bit more without the attempt at a war with the Osage, although we also do see American Indian slavery end under them, so that would have continued and that could also cause conflict as well. So. Because the Spanish didn't really influence a lot of the day-to-day culture here, it's really hard for me to imagine that it would have shifted too much. Although it also depends on how interested in the French monarchy the folks were, because if they were under French control during the French Revolution, that would have probably thrown St. Genevieve for a loop. This is the thing about history, right? That every action and event is really contingent on other events and actions. So if you change just one thing, then the actions and events of the past really could have had drastically different outcomes and drastically different happenings. Absolutely. You know, it's hard to say what could have been because there's all these different pieces that fit into that puzzle. So you've definitely piqued our interest into St. Genevieve and its history. What do we need to know as we plan our visit to the St. Genevieve National Historical Park? Do you have any special exhibits or events that we should plan around or any tips and tricks that will help us get the most out of our visit? First tip for any park service site, go to the Welcome Center, go to the Visitor Center. Lots of information for you there. But we are a new park and we're constantly growing and changing and we're still figuring out what our baseline is going to be. So please, if you're trying to plan a visit, reach out to us. We'll be happy to give you the most up to date on what's going on when you come. I mentioned that we just got the Green Tree Tavern and that is not open yet, but We're aiming to have it open the first weekend in December. So that's probably the most exciting new thing coming up. And we're constantly trying to figure out what else we can do. And we are, again, are only a small portion of the historic preservation here in St. Genevieve. So know that there's other organizations in town, that there's other houses to see, 
we do work together, but we are separate entities. And that can get a little confusing. So knowing that off the bat will help make it a smoother visit as well. So it sounds like we should plan at least a weekend, if not a long weekend, so that we can see and take advantage of everything that St. Genevieve has to offer. There is quite a lot to take in and a lot to see. Absolutely. Where is the best place to reach you and your colleagues if we find ourselves with more questions? Sure. So first place to look for information is our website, which is nps.gov slash STGE. That will have our contact information on it, as well as information on what's open and historical information, all that good stuff. But you can also email us at STGE underscore visitor underscore info at nps.gov or give us a call 573-880-7189. We are happy to take questions or give information through any of those means. I'll place the links to the website and to the email address right in the show notes. Claire Casey, thank you so much for taking the time to take us on an audio tour of St. Genevieve and its early American history. We really enjoyed our visit to the St. Genevieve National Historical Park. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to share it. That's what we're all hoping to do. So we appreciate it. The St. Genevieve National Historical Park uses the historic buildings and homes of St. Genevieve to interpret the French and Spanish colonial history of Missouri. Now, when you look at a map, it may be easy to see St. Genevieve as just another frontier town. It's located over 600 miles north of New Orleans and more than 60 miles south of St. Louis, which, during the 18th and early 19th centuries, was also a small frontier outpost. But as Claire revealed, St. Genevieve was deeply connected with the French and Spanish Atlantic worlds. Now, you have to understand something about early America. Transportation in early America, well, it wasn't really good. Roads were often rough, trunk-lined paths, and spring and fall rains often made these roads near impossible to travel on. This is what made rivers, especially large rivers like the Mississippi River, invaluable to early Americans. These rivers facilitated fast and reliable travelways. So given its situation on the Mississippi River, St. Genevieve's inhabitants had a reliable way to ship their farm and mine produce to market in New Orleans and a reliable way to import goods from France, Canada, and the Caribbean. So while St. Genevieve may seem isolated on early American maps, it was actually a well-connected and busy place. St. Genevieve was also a somewhat cosmopolitan place. As Claire noted, indigenous peoples like the Osage had lived in and around St. Genevieve for hundreds of years before the arrival of the French colonists. And when the colonists arrived, the French, Osage, and other indigenous peoples exchanged cultures, trade goods, and sometimes even spouses. Additionally, the Mississippi River also brought migrants from all around the French and Spanish Atlantic world to St. Genevieve, which is how St. Genevieve's French colonial architecture also came to include Caribbean-style wraparound porches. Now, as we discussed, St. Genevieve and its inhabitants experienced three different imperial regimes. First, the French then the Spanish, and finally the United States. And yet, even as laws and policies and governance changed, St. Genevieve's role as a place where different cultures interacted and intermixed didn't change. It continued to exist as a cosmopolitan place. And the same must be true today. St. Genevieve still exists. Its unique French and Spanish colonial architecture and history continues to draw people from all around the United States and the world to come visit. And when these visitors arrive, they find the St. Genevieve National Historical Park and its organizational neighbors at the ready to assist these worldly visitors in their exploration of St. Genevieve's historic downtown and in the area's early American past. Indeed, St. Genevieve continues to exist as a place that draws worldly travelers and allows different cultures to intermix. Look for more information about the St. Genevieve National Historical Park, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 363. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you're enjoying this road trip series, please tell your friends and family about the show. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Joseph Edelman, Katie Schinebeck, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com.
Finally, this was just the first stop in our three stop summer 2023 road trip series. So stay tuned for our second stop in our very next episode. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. 